And tomorrow we are lucky to hear from the Deputy Commander at STRATCOM, General Wilson, who will be here at 8 tomorrow morning. Then next week, my uh, colleague uh, Rebecca Heinrich and Steve Pfeiffer over at the Brookings Institute will talk again about INF issues and particularly NATO and Russia, of course, and that will be on the 10th. Elon Berman will speak on the 11th. He's the Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council. He'll update his book from last year on Iran. And then uh, our friend uh, Mr. Miller will, from the Scowcroft Group will speak on the 13th about why nuclear deterrence and missile defense strategy matters. For those of you in this in our attending our space series, I have a couple things. The 19th of May is Congressman Bridenstine, who will be talking about his new space initiative that he put out uh, as part of the Armed Services Committee, Mark, but also there's more to be done that is not in the mark, but will be done later. Also, on June 10th, we have a special event at the Reserve Officers Association building uh, across the quad here at 9.30 in the morning. That follows uh, a June 10th breakfast with General Todorov and General Formica on missile defense, which will be here from 8 to 9, and then we're going to walk across the quad and hear from Congressman Schiff, who's going to give us a space speech. I want to make a note that um, the remarks of uh, Secretary Rose are on the record, except for during the Q&A, if you would uh, keep those off the record. also wanted to say hello to a special guest, uh, Dr. Gansler, who is here today, and also my embassy colleagues uh, from Romania, and in particular my friend from South Korea. As many of you know, I spent two years as a student in South Korea, and uh, that country is family. I also want to thank our friends from Voice of America who are filming this for broadcast. And if you have any other questions on that want to be invited, please let me know so I can put you on our mailing list. Our speaker today is a longtime friend and colleague, Frank Rose, Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control and Preparation, and going to be talking to us about the Pacific, about missile defense issues there, particularly our alliance with Japan and Korea, and the issues there that he has to deal with every day. Frank, again, thank you for coming here. I think this is, I don't know, six or seven time you've come and spoken at our group. We always enjoy hearing from you. We'll give a warm welcome to Frank Rose. Well, Peter, it's, oops. Peter, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I was just talking with some of the colleagues at the table. I think I've been coming to your breakfast series for over 20 years now. So it just shows you the longevity of this series. And it's, it continues to be a very, very useful and informative uh, series of events. And I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, this morning, what I thought I would do is update you on the status of U.S. missile defense cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, the recent spate of North Korean ballistic missile launches makes this a good time to discuss these issues. Uh, specifically, I'd like to discuss a couple of key issues. Uh, first, I'd like to outline the policy framework for U.S. missile defenses in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, second, I'll discuss the ballistic missile threat from North Korea. Third, I'll describe the U.S. missile defense deployments in cooperation with allies in the region. Uh, fourth, I'll say a few things about the decision by the United States and the Republic of Korea to begin formal consultations on the potential deployment of a THAAD battery to the ROK. And finally, I'll say a few things about U.S. missile defense policy with regards to China. Let me begin by discussing our policy framework for missile defense in the Asia-Pacific region. The 2010 Ballistic Missile Defense Review, or BMDR, <coughs> provides the policy framework for U.S. missile defenses in the Asia-Pacific region. With regards to regional missile defense, the BMDR states, and I quote, the United States will defend against regional missile threats to U.S. forces while protecting allies and partners and enabling them to defend themselves, end quote. 
Furthermore, the BMDR notes that missile defense supports a number of defense strategy goals, including maintaining U.S. freedom of action, providing reassurance to friends and allies, and strengthening regional deterrence architectures. This has been the policy framework that has guided our missile defense efforts in the region for the past several years. Now let me pivot and discuss briefly the North Korean ballistic missile threat. As we have seen recently, North Korea continues to develop, test, and deploy a number of ballistic missile capabilities. These tests not only improve North Korea's capabilities, but also directly violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions. It also conducted its latest nuclear test on January 6 and has indicated the explicit intention of fitting nuclear weapons to ballistic missiles for potential attack against the U.S. and our allies. Let me begin by briefly recapping some of the most concerning elements of the North Korean ballistic missile program. In 19 uh, 98, the DP North Korea conducted a test launch of a long-range ballistic missile that overflew Japan and irresponsibly dropped a rocket stage close to Japanese territory. While the launch was not a success, it spurred a concerted effort by the United States and our allies to monitor, deter, and counter North Korea's ballistic missile capabilities. Since that time, North Korea has continued to make qualitative and quantitative advances in its ballistic missile program. In 2012, North Korea placed a satellite in orbit with its Taepo Dong-2 space launch vehicle, which uses ballistic missile technology in contravention of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. This February, North Korea once again conducted a space launch using the Taepo Dong-2 system, again in clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions. At a parade in Pyongyang in 2012, the regime unveiled what appeared to be a road mobile uh, ICBM with a range purportedly capable of reaching the United States. Our intelligence community assesses that North Korea has already taken initial steps towards fielding the system, although it has not yet been flight tested. Last October, it paraded a previously unseen new or modified road mobile ICBM. North Korea has also developed an intermediate range ballistic missile, which they call the Musadon, with a range we assess of greater than 3,000 kilometers. The U.S. Strategic Command has assessed that on April 27th and April 28th, North Korea carried out launch attempts of the presumed Musadon IRBMs that were not successful. Additionally, on March 11th and 18th of this year, North Korea launched its short and medium range Scud and Nodong ballistic missiles. North Korea also fields hundreds of SCUDs and Nodong missiles that can reach U.S. forces and forward deployed forces in the ROK and Japan. On April 23rd of this year, U.S. Strategic Command also uh, tracked a North Korean submarine launched ballistic missile. So I think it's fair to say that North Korea is the driver of our missile defense efforts in the Asia Pacific region. Against this backdrop of the North Korean threat, we are continuing missile defense cooperation through our bilateral alliances and key partnerships in the Asia Pacific. Ballistic missile defense is an important as a layer of deterrence and denial and is part of an overarching strategy that also includes sanctions, efforts to return to a credible and authentic talks with North Korea, and bolstering the capabilities of our allies to defend themselves against future potential attacks. Let's begin by discussing our cooperation with Japan, our most robust missile defense relationship in the region. As you're well aware, the U.S. deploys Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense, or Aegis BMD ships, and Patriot batteries in Japan to support the defense of Japan and our deployed forces. 
Japan currently deploys four Congo class BMD destroyers, is upgrading two Agato uh, class destroyers to BMD capability, and has plans to acquire two more Agato class BMD ships, bringing its total to eight BMD capable vessels. It also deploys 24 Patriot batteries along with an extensive indigenously developed early warning radar network. Furthermore, the Japanese defense minister recently stated in the press that Japan was considering the possibility of acquiring the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, or THAC. The United States and Japan are also working closely together to develop the SM-3 Block 2A interceptor, which will make a key contribution to the European phase adaptive approach, as well as ship-based deployments in the Asia-Pacific and other regions around the world. On December 8, 2015, the Missile Defense Agency and the Japanese Ministry of Defense conducted a successful flight test of that interceptor. This development work remains on track for first delivery of the SM-3 Block 2A in the 2018 timeframe. We also deployed in December 2014 a second missile defense radar to Japan, which will enhance the defense of both the United States and Japan. In the policy arena, we continue to engage with Japan on missile defense issues quite regularly including at our bilateral extended deterrence dialogue, which is co-chaired on the U.S. side by the Office of the Secretary of Defense in my bureau at the State Department. And finally, we are continuing to work on enhancing interoperability between U.S. and Japanese forces, which will be aided by the recent changes to the updated U.S.-Japan bilateral defense cooperation guidelines. The inclusion of missile defense in the guidelines reflects the valuable contribution of ballistic missile defense to our collective self-defense. Let me now turn to Australia. Uh, we continue to consult very closely with Australia on missile defense. For example, as a result of the U.S.-Australia Foreign and Defense Ministerial level consultation over the past year, the United States and Australia have established a bilateral BMD working group to examine options for potential Australian uh, contributions to the missile defense architecture in the Asia-Pacific region. Turning to the Republic of Korea, the U.S. currently deploys patriots to defend our deployed forces and support the defense of the ROK. Additionally, the ROK has been improving its own missile defense capabilities. For example, the ROK currently deploys Patriot and last year signed a foreign military sale and direct commercial sale contract to upgrade to Patriot Pac-3 and purchase Pac-3 missiles. The ROK is also developing its own indigenous Korean integrated air and missile defense system and is working to ensure that that system is fully interoperable with U.S. systems. That said, while Patriot provides an effective point defense against shorter range missiles, the U.S. ROK alliance uh, could benefit from more upper tier missile defense capabilities to address the threat from North Korea's extended range SCUDs and no-dong medium-range ballistic missiles. And that's where Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, comes in. In February, the United States and the ROK issued a joint statement which notes that, quote, in response to the evolving threat posed by North Korea, the United States and the Republic of Korea have made an alliance decision to begin formal consultations regarding improvements to the Alliance missile defense posture, specifically the viability of a Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, system in the Republic of Korea. The goal of the formal consultations is to bilaterally explore the feasibility of THAAD deploying to and operating on the Korean Peninsula at the earliest possible date." End quote. If THAAD is deployed to the Korean Peninsula, it would be focused solely on North Korea and contribute to a layered missile defense that would enhance the Alliance's existing missile defense capabilities, 
against North Korean ballistic threats. It is important to note, though, that no final decision on deploying THAAD to the ROK has yet been made. That said, China has expressed its opposition to a possible deployment of THAAD to the Republic of Korea. Why is that? China has expressed two main military technical concerns about the potential deployment of THAAD to the ROK. First, they are concerned about the potential impact of THAAD on China's strategic nuclear deterrent. Second, they see the deployment as part of a larger U.S. quote containment strategy of China. That said, before I discuss China's specific concerns about THAAD, let me say a few things about missile defense more broadly as it concerns China. We have made been clear that our homeland missile defense capabilities provide for the defense of the U.S. homeland from limited intercontinental ballistic missile attack and are purposely not intended to affect Russia or China's strategic deterrent. The ground-based mid-course defense system or GMD system is designed to support that policy and is not scaled, intended, or capable of defending the United States against the larger, more sophisticated arsenals of Russia and China. GMD is designed to protect the U.S. homeland from limited ICBM attacks from states like North Korea and Iraq. So with that context, let me respond to a couple of the technical concerns that China has raised about the potential deployment of THAAD to the ROK. First, THAAD's single-stage interceptors deployed in the ROK would not have the range or capability to intercept Chinese ICBMs headed to the United States. It's pure physics. Uh, second, second uh, some Chinese experts have expressed concern that THAAD's radar could be able to see deep into China and provide the U.S. critical information on Chinese ICBMs. Uh, we've responded very clearly that the radar would not represent an increase in U.S. capability in the region as the United States already has two similar radars in Japan and we have a number of other sensor capabilities in the region uh, including the C-Base X-Bin radar and the Cobra Dane radar in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, now, there have also been stated concerns that the potential THAAD deployment to Korea is part of a larger U.S. containment strategy um, in the region. Uh, again, we have been very clear to our Chinese colleagues. Um, the threat from North Korea's extended range SCUDs and Nodong missiles is the driver for the potential deployment of THAAD to the ROK. It does not have the technical capability to impact China's strategic deterrent. While we will continue to engage China on missile defense, we have made clear to them that as long as North Korea continues to develop, test, and deploy ballistic missiles, we will work with our allies and friends in the region to defend against that threat, including through the deployment of effective missile defenses. And finally, and let me be clear, we have offered on several occasions to discuss China's technical concerns about THAAD, uh, but they have not yet taken us up on that offer. So let me conclude by reiterating that the Obama administration is committed to strengthening our missile defense posture around the world, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. The United States and its allies will not stand unmoved in the face of North Korea's provocative ballistic missile launches and nuclear test explosions. Simply put, North Korea cannot obtain the security, prosperity, or respect it seeks without negotiating an end to its provocative nuclear and missile programs. Finally, China's nuclear deterrent is not and will not be threatened by potential deployment of THAAD to the ROK. At the same time, the United States will remain open to conducting a technical dialogue with China on these issues and one that we would explain the rationale for the deployment of THAAD to Korea. So that's just a brief summary of where we are in the Asia Pacific. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to any questions you may have.